The future of our oceans is inextricably linked to the future of our sustainable ocean farming. Aquaculture is badly damaging the environment, but with demand for seafood at an all-time high, there is no way for aquaculture to slow down. Excess nutrients and waste from aquaculture systems are damaging rivers and marine life in general. Disease risks are increasing, and fish are requiring antibiotic resistance as a result of repeated usage. So, what can we do? How can we put a stop to this? How has the involvement of business people and corporations benefited the aquaculture sector? What impact do global aquaculture operations have on the environment? Is it possible to farm the ocean without destroying it? Let's dive in. Aquaculture is becoming more important in the fight against food insecurity, since per capita fish consumption has risen over the previous six decades. A primary goal of recent technological developments has been the enhancement of efficiency and longevity while also addressing issues of quality. In 2021, venture capitalists invested $39 billion in food technology startups, more than doubling the amount seen in 2020. While the majority of this funding went to online supermarkets and marketplaces, several startups working on modern aquaculture technology also hope to gain from the increased interest of financial backers. Vertical Oceans, for example, received $3.5 million in seed round last year from U.S.-based venture capital fund Kosla Ventures, possibly marking the first time a major Silicon Valley fund has invested in an aquaculture startup. In Singapore, Vertical Oceans has set up a proof-of-concept facility where shrimp are being raised in tanks the size of school buses. Stacking these modern tanks in urban areas would allow for water recycling and would help with supply chain and pollution issues. Many farms that raise Atlantic salmon have also relocated further offshore in an effort to improve their chances of survival. Atlantic Sapphire's land-based operation in Miami aspires to provide 20% of the U.S. salmon market. The firm uses renewable energy to power its operations and draws its water supply from the same aquifier that supplies Miami's drinking water in order to reduce its carbon footprint. In 2020, 56% of all aquatic food for human consumption was from aquaculture. In 2018, Asia was responsible for 90% of worldwide aquaculture output, mostly due to China's output of 66.1 million metric tons. Following China and India, Indonesia produced 14.7 million metric tons, then India produced 7 million metric tons, then Vietnam produced 3.5 million metric tons. Seaweed, oysters, and freshwater carp are some of the most important products of aquaculture in Asia. These are known as low trophic because they feed mostly on plankton, making them more cost-effective and less damaging to the ecosystem than their carnivorous counterparts. According to a 2020 analysis from Planet Tracker, shrimp aquaculture, which is worth an estimated $45 billion worldwide, is responsible for 30% of the degradation of mangroves in Southeast Asia. The absence of mangroves, which serve as an important carbon sink, as well as the flow of garbage, chemicals, and antibiotics from farms, raises the environmental concerns associated with traditional shrimp farming. About 3% of the world's aquaculture harvest comes from America, where white leg shrimp and Atlantic salmon are particularly high in demand. When raised on a large scale, high trophic species like these may be harmful to the environment since they generate more toxic waste and are often fed byproducts from commercial fishing operations. As of 2018, Egypt was responsible for 73.8% of Africa's total aquaculture output. Sub-Saharan Africa may only contribute 2% to world production, but the industry there has been expanding at an annual pace of 11% since 2000. OBG has previously remarked that aquaculture is a useful strategy for reducing poverty and combating food insecurity in Sub-Saharan Africa due to the region's high demand for fish and the strain it puts on local catch fisheries. Most of the continent's aquaculture takes place in lakes, where low-trophic species like tilapia and catfish account for the vast bulk of output. As OBG reported last year, 
Several nations have established blue economy initiatives to conserve marine resources and promote economic recovery from the COVID-19 outbreak. This is in response to the growing threats posed by climate change, overfishing, and ocean acidification to wild fisheries. Many of these plans call for expanding aquaculture as a means to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 14, or SDG 14, which basically aims to conserve and responsibly use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development, as well as boost the economy, reduce poverty, and ensure adequate food supplies. To increase aquaculture production and keep up with demand in developing economies, government help is still necessary. Subsidies shifted from sea fishing to aquaculture can also promote long-term growth while discouraging overfishing at the same time. Salmon aquaculture businesses in Norway are being pushed into less environmentally damaging offshore facilities because water leases are more costly than land leases. Genetically modified farm tilapia, for instance, has greater resilience to illness and is responsible for an 18-58% to 58 increase in output at farms in Bangladesh and China, where disease control efforts are focused. Four African countries, including Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia, have also launched breeding programs to create disease-resistant fish strains native to their respective regions. Great trophic species like salmon and shrimp are in high demand due to urbanization and the rise of the global middle class. But regardless, they still contribute to waste and are fed trash fish from capture fisheries, placing further strain on wild fish populations. While Atlantic Sapphire plans to eliminate fish from its feed entirely by 2025, certain farms are doing experiments to see whether or not salmon fed an insect diet still generate omega-3 fatty acids. Green water ponds and nutritious pond models in smaller-scale enterprises use food waste or underutilized ingredients to increase the carbon content of ponds, thereby increasing productivity. Whereas companies like Vertical Oceans that operate recirculating tanks use microalgae to help filter water. Using modular tanks like ones used by Vertical Oceans might cut down on the carbon footprint of transporting aquaculture goods. It's also possible that farms may be constructed near or even within cities, providing a reliable food supply for expanding metropolitan areas. Forever Oceans, a company located in the United States, has built floating cages to enable fish farming further out in the ocean, away from the dangers of waste buildup in shallow water. The firm already has a farm off the coast of Panama, and it plans to expand into yellowtail production in Brazil and Hawaii. However, the logistics of operating a farm far from the shore can be very difficult. Many people throughout the globe are turning to marine farming because they see the seas as a promising resource for providing both food and cash. For marine farming to persist, responsible management methods must be in place. It's important to think about whether the species being farmed are native to the region or were brought there by humans. This includes not only avoiding the placement of farms near regions where aquatic species naturally gather for breeding or feeding, but also maintaining stocking numbers low so that fish behavior is allowed to stay natural. Along with this, proper waste management must be used to reduce any potential contamination caused by excreted material or excess feed leaching into nearby waters. Since there is a growing demand for fish throughout the world, aquaculture must adopt more sustainable practices to keep up. Fortunately, advances in technology are allowing for more output with fewer negative effects on the environment. Closed systems aquaculture is one such method, and it employs the utilization of either indoor or outdoor tanks or pools to house aquacultured aquatic species in a safe, contained setting. By regulating the waste and preventing the discharge of non-native species, this system minimizes many possible environmental concerns while at the same time reducing the quantity of water required compared to standard open pond systems. Raising fish in captivity or aquaculture has gained a lot of attention in recent years. The environmental impact of farming fish in today's modern aquaculture fish farms is minimized on purpose. Emissions to the environment are kept to a minimum 
because of the employment of cutting-edge technologies and eco-friendly energy sources on these farms. The farms are built to adapt to the strict rules imposed by local, state, and federal authorities, all of which compel them to track and record the amount of carbon dioxide they produce. To further lessen their impact on the environment, several aquaculture businesses have even included renewable energy resources like solar-powered pumps and wind turbines. When compared to conventional fishing techniques, the environmental impact of modern fish farming is minimal. They are more efficient, produce more fish, and have less of an impact on the environment. Along with this, Fish in today's fish farms are in good health because of the clean water and balanced nutrition they get. However, this does not mean that all environmental risks associated with modern fish farming have been eliminated. Research is still being conducted to ensure sustainable practices.